Thank, uh, thank you, Chair. My name is Suresh. Uh, you can hear me at the back, can you? Uh, I've actually ripped my speech out because I've heard some of the things and I just want to make certain points which I think are important. Um, people of my age, black and brown people, were baptized into activism because of the murderous intent of racism. And what Baraj has said, I just want to put meat on his framework. I came to Southall in 1975. I know Baraj was born there or lived there for much longer than I have. I came to Southall because when I was doing A-levels in Nelson, Lancashire, out of the blue came the wave of packy bashing. And I got stabbed by school friends of mine who were skinheads. And I say school friends of mine because we played football and cricket together. The police were notified, but took no action, and that perpetrator went past my house every day for about six months. There were only 10 of us in a school of a thousand, and six of them were boys and four were women, mainly Pakistani individuals and people of Indian origin. We had no chance to fight against a group of 20, 30 people. And every playground, every time there was a recess or a lunch break, we were confronted by 20 or 30 people. Before the stabbing, I made all sorts of excuses not to fight. My, my, my crime was I was the tallest of the people and they picked on me because they thought, I, if, they, if they were able to damage me, then the others would run away. Luckily for me, the smallest of them, a stocky person, <laughs> Abdul Wahid, was fearless and audacious, and he stood his ground. The fear of being attacked was much greater than the attack itself, and that fear paralyzes you. Abdul had no fear whatsoever and he survived. The only time that the packy bashing stopped was when Abdul brought a small pen knife to defend himself in school and all of us, six Asian boys, got suspended from school. But the packy bashing stopped. There's a lesson in that and I want to come to that in a minute. My refuge was to leave Lancashire and discover Southall. On the 5th of June, the day after Gurdeep Singh Chagga was killed, I happened to be outside the Dominion Cinema when news reports came of a killing in Southall and spoke about him being killed outside the Dominion Cinema. And as I looked on my left, I saw a police officer guarding a pool of blood near a railing. And I thought, I'm looking at a murder scene. And I went to the police officer and said, what are you doing here? What is this blood? And his reply was, and I'll never forget this, and this is actually what made us angry. This is just Indian blood, or just an Indian Asian blood. And then he asked me to run away or go away. And the anger of seeing that blood and the manner in which that police officer spoke Treating a young Asian's death as a worthless incident is what made us angry that day. Yesterday, we young children in Southall carried a red flag in commemoration of the killing of Blair Peach and Kurdebi Saga. The reason why they carried the red flag is when the police officer told us to run away, we actually went back to him and then he fled himself. He actually left the murder scene unguarded. 
we got a red piece of cloth and put that on the pool of blood as a mark of respect for Gurdip Singh Chagar. It was obvious in 1976, the day after Chagar's murder, that young people had no access to power or space. The payment was the only thing we had to we could write on. So I and my friend Dennis Ameda wrote, this murder will be avenged. We'll get you racist come. I know I've written it because the fascist is spelled wrong. We always spell it like racist <laughs> in South Hall. Right? The S is missing. Galvanized people. It was spontaneous. Young people came out. The Victory Pub was next to it. There's no organization. SM, SYM was built on the back of that spontaneous uprising by young people. But at that time, there was absolute energy and creativity among young people in South Hall. The raid demands, they started speaking from the platforms. A day later, the Indian Workers Association was having a meeting, I think, about passing a resolution about the growth of fascism. People stormed and took over the stage and said, it's actually the police who are a problem for us. And we went to the police station and surrounded it. That's the beginning of spontaneity, creativity, energy of young people. It's not that the youth organizations didn't exist. I think Baraj would correct me if I'm wrong. There was the Indian Youth Association before that, but it ran clubs rather than political action. It's an important piece of history. Now, years later, I think only a year later, I was told that Uddham Singh, who murdered General, assassinated General Dwyer, the army officer responsible for the massacre at Jallianwala Bagh 100 years, also wrote on a piece of payment at Jallianwala that this murder will be avenged. That's not because there's an innate connection with what we were doing and Uddham Singh. It's whenever we, fear, whenever we see and witness injustice by people who are never held to account, the only option we have is to fight that injustice. And I want to use that example to look at what we can do in terms of fighting and build blocks to challenge fascism and racism. Just want to speak about 79 and 81 before I go into that. Just, I mean, the 79 events are very, very critical. You have the National Front and state agencies colluding with each other. And I'll explain why I said that, and I use my words very carefully. Colluding with each other to destroy and damage community organization in a small town which is only about five square miles. Just look at the facts. The National Front should have never been allowed to come to a town when they openly propagate compulsory repatriation of black and brown people who are residents or British citizens in this country. That's what they actually did. At the meeting, their leaders said that South Hall should have been bulldozed or should be bulldozed and replaced by an English helmet. That's the demand he made. The National Front, when they went in at 7.30, gave Nazi salutes and Ziegars. You look at the video and see it for yourself. Peaceful protest organized by communities, led by the SYM and IWA and other organizations, met with serious, brutal forms of violence. Blair Peach isn't the only casualty. Of course he's killed. We treat him as our brother. That's why we have laid flowers every year on his commemoration. See him as an elder brother. But 700 people were arrested in a space of five hours. They were taken to police stations outside South or some on the motorway M1, and actually left and released after 1 o'clock. They couldn't even come home. 345 people were charged with criminal, criminal uh, charges at 
deliberately tried at Barnet Magistrates Court, not with juries, with juryless courts, with stipendary magistrates brought from Diplop courts in Northern Ireland. The conviction rate in the first five months was 86% of anybody coming into that court. We had no chance with the magistrates that performed on the day. The local authority, who were canvassed not to allow the meeting to take place, bulldozed after the police had gone into People's Unite Centre that housed Misty and Roots and other ragged groups. The SPG had gone in. Actually, when people fled their violence, I remember somebody called John Bruno at, at the roof. We thought he was going to die. Snatched from the roof. Forty-odd people taken down the steps, and when they're brought outside, faced a gauntlet of police officers with truncheons. An ambulance man was beaten so badly when he is actually treating a police officer. The police went in into the misty and roots recording studio at the basement and used razor blades to tear off the soundproofing system. They damaged all the musical equipment that they had. The council bulldozed that building, smashed it to smithereens, about a month later, and do you know what the, beat, the council leader got for her work? An OBE for community relations. It's not just the violence, it's that cynicism that we faced in the 1979. 81 needs to be looked in that context. And there's a historical context which Baraj alludes to, and I just want to put some facts into that. 81 is, uh, if you talk to eyewitnesses account, skinheads coming in coaches, trying to play in a pub at the end of South or Broadway, linked to white supremacist ideology, come out and start smashing and beating up people. An old woman outside Maharaja restaurant. And one person, I think, is Matharu, who actually saw his relative beating, and went into the youth clubs, went into pubs, and went into the SIM office, and within a matter of hours, the young people and people on the Broadway had managed to take on the skinheads and burn that pub. That is the basis of self-defense. Let me just tell you that that learning ground and some of the lessons that we have learned have been used by people in the monitoring group and us to develop campaigns nationally since then. I was the coordinator of the Stephen Lawrence campaign, of Zayed Mubarak campaign when Zayed was murdered by his cellmate at Feltham Young Offenders Institute in, uh, in 2000. Victoria Klimbia campaign, currently the Mark Duggan campaign. And it's not true that the Bradford 12 experience hasn't been repeated. Three years ago, we used the same expertise and the same lawyers we used on Bradford 12 for Rotherham 12 um, um, defendants. Rotherham had been rocked by the sex scandal. The EDL had come there every month. 12 marches in one year. And whenever they came, the Muslim community was hiding in their homes, not allowed to go to the daily business, couldn't even go to mosque. In fact, three months before the march, Moshin Ahmed, an 86-year-old man, was beaten to death simply for looking like a Muslim. Young people came out, and they passed a pub which was owned and run by five white far-right extremists. They were provoked, they fought back. They were charged with violent disorder. The witnesses against them, all white witnesses, were actually members of far-right extremist organizations belonging to Yorkshire's finest, or this finest, or that finest. This is in legal papers. It took us months to get the intelligence reports 
from prosecution when they had them. We use the same argument that we used in Bradford 12 about self-defense. In fact, we went, become even more creative. We asked a barrister before the second part of the trial, after the prosecution is case, the case is finished, for Mike Mansfield to give an hour and a half history of racism in Rotherham to the jury. The judge protested, but we've still continued. And that's the creativity in the legal process we've used continuously. That form of punishment of a community that is organized is not new. It's been used in Ireland before. It's been used against the miners in the 1984. And more importantly, as people were speaking about it, it's actually a, an experience that colonized countries have endured in India, in the African continent, Kenya, specifically, for example, where I was born, and in, in, in the West Indies. Let's just, I just want to read this out to you because I think it's important to remember how the British state colludes with each other to create punitive mechanisms and detentions on people who they feel are troublesome and resisting. And this is something that I've written. I'm just going to read it out. Colonial history supplies rich evidence on how state power and that its development of colonial periphery is as significant and informative as its deployment in the metropole, right? Throughout the 19th century, British administrators and lawmakers engaged in a series of projects culminating in the Criminal Tribes Act in 1871 that subjected difficult to manage sections of the Indian population to a range of punitive control mechanisms. Those, these extended to scope of law from dealing with individual conduct to the introduction of crime by association and deemed criminality to be both hereditary and cultural. By the time British quit India in 1947, somewhere between three and four million children, women, and men were subjected to criminal tribes controlled slavery. Contonements actually built by the British. In the West Indies, native populations had been exterminated and replaced by slaves violently imported from Africa. The prison was introduced and developed in Jamaica initially as an institution to sustain slavery, recaptured runaways, and privately committed slaves massively outnumbered those committed through legal process. Despite British slave societies seeing the prisons as evidence of their modernity, their reaction to resistance was bloody and spectacular. Following the 1831 slave rebellion, at least 312 people were hanged. An unknown number were shot without trial, and heads of the executed left for months and displayed in polls. This is our history, our country's history, in terms of how it deals with black and brown population. And I'm not saying South or compares to that. What I'm saying is, the notion of control and smashing the backbone of community organization exists in this country and has been applied in this country. And when you look at policing in the 70s, by the 70s, we're not talking about stop and searches. We were talking about sus. We were experiencing just loitering on the street and are being arrested for it. Not stopped and searched, we were taken straight in police station and charged. The idea of us as immigrants, as worthless and dangerous, was already established in the police attitudes. Look at Sir Kenneth Newman's comments in 1982 describing Jamaicans. This is what he says. Jamaicans are a people who are constitutionally disorderly. This is the Metropolitan Police Commissioner. All right? It's simply in their makeup, he says. And Chinese are deviously cunning. This is a person who had served as the head of Royal Const Ulster Constabulary in Northern Ireland and was brought specifically into Britain. 
1981 and 82. And the reason for that is because of the uprisings throughout 30 cities across Britain, Bristol, Brixton, All Saints Road in Notting Hill, Moss Side in Manchester, Liverpool 8, all inner city town centres, conurbations of black communities. And he created what are known as terror areas in London, where he thought there were criminality acts taking place, which required more penetration of police saturation. You know what they are? Tottenham. That's why you have the whole mechanism in Tottenham going on of police control right up to now. Brixton, Southall, All Saints Roads. If you look at 1976, and I'll finish in a minute, a cursory glance will tell you the kind of racism we faced. 76 starts with the National Front picketing at Gatwick Airport when the Malawi Asians are being brought in, and there are tabloid reports of them living in five-star hotels. June, you have the racist murder of Gudeep Singh Chaga. It's not the first murder. Abdul Malik, a 14-year-old boy, had been killed during the busing process in Southall in 1974. August, you have the first Notting Hill so-called riots. <coughs> August, you also have what Taro alluded to, the Grunwick strike and the role of the special patrol group in trying to dismantle that organized support for them. September, you have the National Front picketing outside Heathrow Airport to stop migration coming into the country. December, you have the enactment of the 1971 Race Relations Act. Just one year from my memory tells you exactly what brown and brown people were suffering. Missed one thing. In June, Eric Clapton, an iconic musical singer, stopped his concert in the middle of his performance, and this is what he said, and he's never, ever apologized for it. OK, I'll just read it on and then I'll finish. OK? Um, right in the middle of it, there are about 2,000 people in the audience. He says, do we have any foreigners in the audience tonight? If so, please put up your hands. Wogs, I mean. I'm looking at you. Where are you? So where are you? Well, wherever you all are, I think you should all just leave. Not just leave the hall, leave your country, your fucking packies. I don't want you here in the room or in my country. Listen to me, man. I think we should be what for Enoch Baal. Enoch's our man. I think Enoch's right. I think we should send them all back. Get the wogs out. Get the coons out. Keep Britain white. I used to be into dope. Now I'm into racism. It's much more heavier, man. And goes on for three and a half minutes. This is Eric Clapton. People use him all the time, and he played with Bob Marley just a month afterwards. <laughs> Fascism doesn't come with the boots and jackets anymore. It comes with ordinary people looking you like me and you, with suits, in schools. And Europe tells us that the growth of the far right, where far right members are part of the government, means that they are policy makers, government officers, they have supporters who are police officers. And I'm not painting a picture of doom and gloom. I don't have time to talk about resistance. Maybe people can ask me a question, and I'll go through what the building blocks for resistance and why South is so important. But thank you for listening to me.